All right. Well, it's recording. Well, thanks, you guys, for joining me. And uh, we're continuing. This is our second study in this overarching series that I've, I've basically come to call Kingdom Hermeneutics. Uh, it's basically Kingdom Bible Study Methods. How do we, as believers in the Kingdom of God, study the Bible from beyond a cerebral time statement perspective? We all know the time statements. We all know at hand, quickly, shortly, you know, the time draws near. That's wonderful. Uh, some of those time statements convinced us to become what we call preterists. But just to believe something happened is not, does not mean that we experience the fullness of the blessing of the gospel, as Paul called it. That is the fullness of the kingdom of God. And I believe uh, that all of us can get so much more joy when we find out what sort of things actually have been fulfilled. One of the biggest questions I always had was, why were those apostles so dang happy? <laughs> I'm like, man, what, what is going on here? You know, what, what am I missing out on? So, you know, I came to believe in grace, uh, saw the divinity of Christ, the fundamental tenet of the faith, and then, and then I came to see the kingdom. And I'm like, wow, that's great. Okay, it was fulfilled. And, and I saw these beautiful things in the Old Testament um, you know, that were fulfilled, but I didn't really own, own those things. It was more like, yes, they were fulfilled, but, but how? What does that mean? You know, wolf dwelling with the lamb and a little boy playing by the viper's den. What does that mean to me? How do I interpret those, those metaphors? Some people literalize those things and say, well, it has not yet been fulfilled. We're waiting for a thousand-year millennial kingdom where we can actually physically see a little boy playing by a viper, you know, playing with a little viper and not getting his hand bit. And, uh, and so for me, it was like, okay, I, I see that it's fulfilled, but how? What does that mean in my life? And I believe, I personally believe that the more we understand about how God uses metaphor about this gorgeous, uh, triumphant kingdom, the more joy we will have. But it's not just an understanding. Okay, so before I start on today's lesson, I want to emphasize something. You know, we hear a lot today about um, new age type people, hippie type people, which I don't have a problem with hippies. You know, I think hippies are cool. Uh, new age. It's a little funky, and uh, they talk a lot about meditation. So when we hear the word meditation, we immediately shrink back and think Shirley MacLaine um, or Tom Cruise or, or one of these uh, people that's, that's off into la-la land, you know, that's separate from the gospel, separate from God, but just more sort of an om, om. What does that mean? Well, the Bible speaks about meditation. And I think God is the one who actually started meditation. <laughs> he encouraged it because he knows that meditation works. But the real question is, on what do we meditate? That's the question of the hour. What are we meditating upon and, and how will it affect our lives? You know, in Nehemiah, um, he says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. I want you to think about that for a second. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, I certainly don't claim to have that uh, corner on the market as far as joy is concerned. I struggle with it qu quite a bit, actually. And one of the reasons, there are two reasons I struggle with it. Number one, I don't engage myself with those passages that deal with this coming kingdom as far as the Old Testament prophets and godly men and women were concerned. They were looking forward to this coming kingdom. And so I don't really um, engage myself with those passages. But second, I don't spend enough time actually meditating on, first of all, and I know this sounds very cliche, the first thing we need to remember when we're trying to pursue joy is this, meditate on God. That's it. First and foremost, we meditate on the character and nature of God, who he is and what he does, who he is and what he does. He wants to be known as holy. He wants to be known as merciful, as loving, as righteous, as just, as compassionate, as filled with tender mercies. He wants to be meditated upon and he wants us grateful for who he is and what he does and what he has done perhaps most importantly. 
And so we meditate on his person. And therefore, we, by extension of his person, is his uh, unchangeable or immutable work. So we meditate on his person and we meditate on the finished work of Christ. Well, for instance, in Reformed theology, they can say, yes, we meditate on the finished work of Christ. And so they will talk about the cross. They will talk about his plan of salvation and redemption and choosing us and calling us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And, and so, yes, they are very cross-centered. The problem is, is they don't understand that the cross and resurrection was to fulfill all of these huge huge, as Trump would say, huge promises that God made to the fathers and the prophets. So when we say, yes, I focus on the cross and the resurrection, the Bible says that through the resurrection in Acts chapter 13, through the resurrection, God fulfilled all of the promises made to the fathers. So the first question that should rise up to the forefront of our mind is this, what were those promises? You know, we see in Luke chapter 1, verses 69 through the end of the chapter, that Jesus Christ came to fulfill the mercy and the promises made to Abraham and the fathers. What were those promises? Romans chapter 15, verse 8, Paul says that Jesus Christ came to confirm the promises made to the fathers. So we have to know what those promises are. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 1, 21, all the promises of God in him, are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God. We have to know what those promises are if we are to get the same joy that the disciples in the book of Acts had. No wonder they could take a sword into the stomach and say, Lord, forgive them, man. I'm excited to be one of your children. You know, how do you do that? You know, and here we are in plush United States of America. You know, we're not getting killed for our faith, and we're sitting there in our rooms in our darkness or loneliness or whatever the case, woe is me. Woe is me. You know, we're, we're, we're like, like Hebrews. I think it's chapter 12. You have not yet resisted unto blood, <laughs> right? So we need to think about that. Why is our joy lacking? And I believe that there are prescriptions in the Bible, and they work. And when I have applied them by the grace of God, I'm actually a joyful person. When I'm not, I'm a jerk. <laughs> Just being honest, you know. I don't like being a jerk. My kids, ask my kids, you know, do you like it when your dad's a jerk? You know, let's say, yeah, we, we like it. We like it. No, just kidding. They, they, would, they wouldn't say that. They'd say, no, we actually don't like it when dad is a jerk. But we would never call dad a jerk, even though we kind of in our minds think he is. But yeah, sometimes I struggle with joy. And sometimes I project it onto other people. But when I do meditate, when I find myself really saturating myself with the kingdom promises and the cross and the resurrection and the divinity of Christ, and God's character and nature. When I meditate on all those things, man, I'm a more joyful person. And by God's grace, you can be too. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, focus on the second part. And we're going to look at our next text in Matthew. And for those of you who are new, what we're doing is we're moving our way through the entire New Testament. We are looking at every single allusion or quotation from an Old Testament passage. And we're not just going to read it. But we are going to put ourselves in the shoes of the first century Jewish Christians who knew their Old Testament so that when there was a quotation of an Old Testament passage, the, the, whoever quoted it, be it Paul or John or James or Jesus, whoever quoted it didn't need to quote the whole passage. They just needed, quote, needed to quote one part, and they knew that their audience, which primarily consisted of Jewish Christians, already was familiar with that passage. But for us, 21st century, far removed Gentiles from an Old Testament prophetic, uh, prophetic framework, we generally speaking don't have a working knowledge of the Old Testament. When I say we, I'm talking about Christendom at large. Uh, Gentile Christendom at large doesn't have a working knowledge of the Old Testament because generally speaking, they don't read their Bibles. But what we have done as believers in fulfilled redemption, we have begun to dig into the scriptures and they've come alive to us. Those Old Testament passages are no longer speaking to some sort of uh, thousand year future millennial physical kingdom. But now what we have the privilege of saying is they are fulfilled in Christ. So what is it that's fulfilled and what made those disciples so doggone happy? Just, just, it's like, come on, what do you, what do you got that I don't got? 
You know what I mean? What is making you smile? What would make Peter say, therefore we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory? You know, sometimes when I read that, I forget what I have. The Bible says he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. The Bible says you are complete in him. The Bible says we lack nothing. So if we're lacking nothing, why can't I have that joy that the apostles have? Well, I would, I would contend that one of the main reasons is this. We don't know the context, the Old Testament prophetic context like they did and, and do. <laughs> and we don't understand. If you, if you don't know them, then you can't possibly realize they're fulfilled. So you have to get to know them first. And then you realize, oh my gosh, those are fulfilled. And so no wonder Paul was just blown away. No wonder Paul could sit there and go, yeah, man, I rejoice when I get beaten. I glory in my infirmities. Man, I, I can't believe that God would count me worthy, worthy to suffer for his kingdom. I'm jazzed. I have immortality. I will never die. I am in the presence of the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, creator of heaven and earth, who will never cast me out of his presence. I am in a new covenant, which is, which is not dictated by fear. It's not dictated by sin. It's not dictated by guilt. It's not dictated by shame. And it's not dictated by bondage. I am in a new covenant of righteousness, of freedom, of joy, of immortality, of life everlasting, and most importantly, presence with Jesus Christ. We are in his presence now. We're not waiting for it. We're not waiting to die. We're not waiting for a rapture. We have the King of Kings in our lives. He is dwelling in us. Okay? So I'm going to share a screen right now. We're going to work our way through these scriptures and look at the Old Covenant, uh, Old, Old Testament prophetic context. And I really believe that um, all of us will, will be blessed as we read these scriptures and by the power of the Spirit of God, which I truly believe that He is working in us to. Uh, to encourage us in his kingdom. All right, let me start this slideshow here. Takes a little time to get used to this, but thanks for your patience. All right, here we go. So this is a, a, a repeat uh, PowerPoint page uh, for those of you who were here last week. Kingdom hermeneutics. When studying the New Testament, it is imperative that we have at least a portion of understanding that a first century Jew might have. In other words, if we don't know our Old Testament, we will never know or understand the context they understood when Jesus or the apostles quoted an Old Testament passage. So here is our text for today. We covered the text in Matthew 1, verses 21 through 23, and now we're looking at the next one, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through 6. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king, Behold, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? Now, I want to remark here that when you see something highlighted in blue, it's my way of saying, take notes, and whenever you see, get yourself maybe some multiple different colored highlighted pens and write down certain words. And these are what I would call kingdom elements. So you will find many Old Testament passages speaking of God as king. You will find many Old Testament passages where Israel and the Gentiles will worship God. So that they came and said, we've seen a star in the east and have come to worship him. This is God incarnate. But when Herod, the king, heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written. Now, right then, 
as a 21st century Gentile who's been converted to Christianity, to belief in Christ, to faith in Christ, we need to stop and say, do I know that whole context? So that's what we need to do. So we're going to look first at the King of Jews and this idea of Christ being governor. And it says it is written by the prophet. What prophet? Well, this is Micah. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the governors of Judah. For out of you shall come a governor who shall rule my people, Israel. Okay, so the first thing we look at is governor. It's a guarantee that out of Bethlehem, here's a, here's a prophecy that was made four to 600 years before Christ, and it says, out of you shall come forth a governor that will rule my people, Israel. Well, let's take it back to the beginning. Let's go back to Genesis, which literally means beginning. It's basically the beginning of God's covenant relationship with his people. Not so much the beginning of, of the cosmos or the universe, but it's the beginning of God's covenant relationship with his people. Judah, you are he whom your brethren shall praise. Your hand shall be in the neck or on the neck of your enemies. By the way, we're going to see a lot of passages that deal with God's judgment on those who don't believe, and we're going to explain a little bit about how that works and how it worked through us. You know, we're so used to growing up in churches where we just say, you're going to hell, you're going to burn forever, I condemn you, <laughs> and uh, it's really not that way. It's something much more pleasant for us and much more subdued simply by the word of the gospel, as we will see later on. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you've gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? Now right here, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. And we see this promise also in Psalm 89, that, that, that Judah would never lack a man to be on the throne. So the scepter, which is indicative of a king holding out this instrument that, that symbolized his or her authority, a king or queen. Uh, a scepter uh, symbolized their authority. So the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. Now, in case you're wondering, most likely from between his feet, we also see that phrase from between her feet. I think it's in maybe in Deuteronomy. It's simply talking about their genitals. It's saying that, look, out of your loins, there, there will never be a king to, uh, to lack sitting on the throne. They, they will, there will be a king constantly sitting on the throne out of your loins, out of the tribe of Judah. So it says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, or you might even say between his legs, okay? I know it sounds kind of crass, but it's, that's just the language there. Until Shiloh come. And the Hebrew word Shiloh literally means tranquil. In other words, until the one who brings tranquility comes. So Shiloh, Shiloh is, is a word that's referring to God who brings tranquility or peace. And this is fascinating. And unto him shall be the gathering of the people. So we're dealing with the governor, the governor of, of Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, the king of the Jews. Okay, so let's, let's continue here. More on this issue of the government. King of the Jews and, quote, governor who shall rule my people Israel. Now, we've seen this. I was just talking to my boys about this, and I talked to people about uh, the hymns of the faith all the time, uh, Christmas hymns, what we call Christmas hymns. Joy to the world, oh, come all you faithful. Um, you know, goodness, uh, hark the herald angels sing. All these really joyful praise praise songs and with lyrics that that glorify God as current king, not as a coming king, but as, as king. Here he is, he's born, king of the Jews. We've come to worship him. <laughs> so here it is. We, we quote this verse all the time, but do we really believe it's fulfilled? Remember, our context was Matthew 2, verses 1 through 6, quoting Micah, which we're going to get to, about the governor who would come out of Bethlehem. For unto us a child is born, Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now notice, there are no 2,000-year gaps in between there. It doesn't say for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, but 2,000 years later, the government shall be upon his shoulder. 
It says the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor. This is Jesus, the mighty God. This is Jesus, the everlasting Father. This is Jesus, the Prince of Peace. And we're going to look at that word peace, which I should have uh, highlighted it in blue right there. The word peace, but I did here. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Now, personally, uh, my, my particular viewpoint is this kingdom continues growing. That's the triumph of the kingdom of God and the everlasting gospel. It never stops. People continue to enter in through the gates of the city, as we see in Isaiah 60 and, and Revelation 21. They continue to enter into the gates of the city, and they're never shut day or night so that kings and Gentiles may bring their honor and glory into it. Okay? There shall be no end upon the throne of David. David was a Jew, Judah. And upon his kingdom to order it, and watch, you're going to see this, the uh, sovereignty of God here, to order it and establish it with judgment. So I highlighted kingdom, and I highlighted judgment. And most of the time, we have a tendency to look at judgment as, you know, we're in, you know, ours kicking mode. You know, we're, we're with Jesus, and we go out there, and we take names, man, doggone it, and we put people in their, uh, their proper place. Really, many times, judgment, when it's used, it has to do with righteous judgment. Remember, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you judge after what you see and what you hear. But I judge righteous judgment. In other words, I look at the heart. It doesn't necessarily mean condemnation. It's righteous judgment. It's, he's a judge. He exercises good judgment. You know, sometimes we as parents, we, we encourage our kids. You need to exercise better judgment, right? Just discernment. And so here's Jesus. He exercises discernment, good discernment. Why? In contrast to the Pharisees who were horribly unbalanced. In fact, when the Bible speaks of several things, six things, yea, seven that the Lord hates, one of the things it says is a false balance. Well, our first, uh, our, our first inclination is to tell oh, balance, you know, like a, a little balance with two little uh little baskets that weigh what you put in it. You put gold in here, gold in here, whatever, and, and make sure that it's balanced. And we say, well, God hates a false balance. Well, I think it's, it's deeper than that because the Pharisees were terribly imbalanced and unbalanced, and they judged unrighteous judgment. The Bible says that Jesus would not judge after his eyes, nor the hearing of his ears. We hear gossip all the time, and the first thing we naturally do is believe it. Or if we see someone getting caught up in something they shouldn't be doing, the first thing we do is make a judgment. How could they do that? Well, Jesus never judged that way. And he said there would come a time in the Old Testament where he would judge righteous judgment. And now finally the king has come. And we, by extension of Christ, now know how to judge righteous judgment, that it's not based upon what we see, performance, or what we hear, gossip, the tongue, an unruly evil that's like a rudder on a huge ship and it turns it, or a bit in a horse's mouth, it turns it. The tongue, it says it's an unruly evil. No, we are not to judge that way. We judge righteous judgment. And the righteous judgment is based upon faith solely in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us, as Paul said. So to order it and establish it with judgment or justice, it's fair. It is balanced. And with justice from henceforth, even forever. Now watch this. Here's the sovereignty of God. If I ever saw the sovereignty of God, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Sometimes we, we think of God as sort of this mechanic, mechanical, uh, omni, omniscient being in the sky that just does things mechanically, you know, as if, as if there's no passion in his heart. I disagree. I disagree. I tend to argue for the omni-emotionality of God, the zeal of the Lord of hosts. You know, love one another as I have loved you. God passionately loves us. God is zealous about us. He is filled with tender mercies, and his compassion never fails, and he loves, he delights in mercy. And so God does this because he's so zealous. He, he, he just can't hold back because it's his nature to love us. And so he fulfilled it through the work of Christ on the cross and his resurrection. 
Now we go to our text to consider. So we looked at the passage in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, and he quotes from Micah. Now this is kind of a long passage, so bear with me here. Micah 5, verses 1 through 15. Now gather yourself in troops, daughter of a troop. One sets a siege against us. They shall strike the judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek. And you, Bethlehem of Fratah, you being least among the thousands of Judah, out of you he shall come forth to me, so that he is Jesus, he shall come forth to me, the Father, to become ruler in Israel. And that's the passage quoted by Matthew. He whose goings forth have been from of old, from the days of eternity. Daniel calls Jesus the ancient of days. From, from everlasting to everlasting, Psalm says, you are God. So this is Jesus. Now, we look at the rest of the context. We look at the rest of the context. And this is fascinating. While almost every Christian will say that, yes, this is fulfilled. Jesus. He was born, and he is to be governor of Judah. And they say, one day he will be. What we see here is that Jesus is now the governor. And he's been the governor ever since he came down, God incarnate, to fulfill his work of righteousness, which Romans says, I will work a short work in your days, and it shall be marvelous in your eyes. And now let's look at the rest of the context, which Matthew doesn't quote because Jesus didn't need to, or the, the writer of Matthew didn't need to. He didn't need to quote this because he knew they understood the entire context. But we, 2,000 years later, we don't even know the context, let alone understand it. And here we begin. Therefore, he will give them over until the time the one giving birth has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the sons of Israel. And he shall stand and feed in the strength of Jehovah, in the majesty of the name of Jehovah his God, and they shall sit, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and this one shall be peace. In other words, this governor, this ruler would be peace. He wouldn't just bring peace. He would be peace. Does everybody get it? Ephesians chapter 2, speaking of Jesus, this is fulfilled. For he is our peace. He making us both one, that is Jew and Gentile, and they were previously at enmity with one another, enemies, they were fighting, he has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. And earlier in the passage, or actually in, in that same passage, it says he has abolished in his flesh the enmity between God and man. So think about that. He's broken down the barrier between God and man and made peace between God and man. And he's broken down the barrier between Jew and Gentile so that they are now one. You can't identify yourself anymore as I'm Jew, and I'm, but I'm Gentile. No, he says, in Christ there is no more Jew, Greek, barbarian, Scythian, bond, free, male, nor female. But in Christ, you are all one. Think about that one. The Bible says in, uh, I believe it's Isaiah chapter uh, 57, it says your land should be called Hephzibah and Beulah. And he says, you shall be married to that land. You'll be, you're married. Did you know we're all married? <laughs> I know you're thinking, uh-oh. Uh-oh, there goes creepy ward again. We're all married in the eyes of God. The Bible says we are one. And that's why Jesus says in the resurrection, they are neither married nor given in marriage in the physical sense, but they are as the angels of God in heaven. You say, well, how, how can you say we're as the angels of God in heaven? You know what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12? You have come to an innumerable company of angels and to the spirits of just men made perfect. That's how. Because the Bible says there is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. It's not about physical marriage. It's not about Gentiles. It's not about physically bearing children anymore. 
It's about the spiritual children. Paul called Timothy, my own son in the faith. That's what he said. We're related to each other because we are all in Christ. He's our husband. We're one body. Many members, one body. And this one shall be peace when he shall come into our land and when he shall walk in our palaces. Then we shall raise against him seven shepherds. In other words, Assyria represents the enemies of God. It's not specifically speaking about Assyria as much as it is the enemies of God. And specifically at the time of Christ, it was the Pharisees who were likened unto Sodom and Gomorrah in Isaiah chapter 1. Who were likened unto Miss Babylon in Revelation. In fact, in fact, the Pharisees were called Mystery Babylon. The Ju Jerusalem was called Mystery Babylon the harlot. So she's compared to Egypt and Sodom and Gomorrah and Babylon. In other words, she basically is considered heathen to God's people. It, the exact opposite. In fact, God said the person who, who slays an ox is as if he cut off a dog's neck. He described the Pharisees, actually the Israelites of old, he described them as eating swine's flesh and eating mice. And no wonder they hated Isaiah. Because Isaiah is saying that you eat swine's flesh and you eat mice. Like, Wait a minute, we don't do that. We, we don't, that's forbidden. That's, a, that's against the strict dietary laws of Moses. And Isaiah says, no, you eat mice and you eat swine's flesh. They didn't do it literally, but it, as far as God was concerned, that's what you do. Your sacrifices, it's as if you eat swine's flesh. It's as if you cut off a dog's neck. It's as if you eat every vile thing that I forbade in the Old Testament. And so therefore, he likens them to Sodom. He calls them Sodom. Imagine Isaiah calling the Israelites, you're Sodom. You're Egypt. You're like Gomorrah. And they're going, that is so wrong. Can you imagine them? That is wrong. And legend has it that Isaiah was sawn in two. They killed the prophets. And they killed more prophets. And then finally, Jesus comes along. And the Bible says, last of all, the Lord of the vineyard sent his son. Last of all. That tells us something. It's a time frame reference. That's it. It's like, okay, last of all, they killed his son. And Jesus said, what do you think the Lord's going to do to those wicked husbandmen? And the Pharisees actually answered in one account, well, he will, he will miserably destroy them. And give his nation, give his kingdom to another nation, which renders fruit in its season. So in other words, they are described exactly like the people they were judging. They would judge people for breaking dietary laws. They would judge people for offering up sacrifices to idols. Well, the fact was, is they were worshiping themselves. And their sacrifices, the Bible, remember in Proverbs, it says, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. How much more when he brings it with an evil heart? That was the Pharisees to the core. And so that was the indictment against them from the mouths of the prophets throughout the Old Testament time frame. And Jesus finally makes the anathema. That's right. He anathematizes the Pharisees. He says, you strain at a gnat and you swallow a camel. You're a whitewashed grave filled with dead men's bones. How shall you escape the condemnation or damnation of hell? That's what he told the Pharisees. Why? Because they trusted in their sacrifices. They trusted in their works. And they judged people and they pointed the finger and they cast people out as evil. Even though they were believers, they would catch someone in a sin and want to put them to death. And so, basically, when the Syrians shall come into our land, that's what the Pharisees tried to do. They tried to come into the church. They crept in privately trying to say, hey, you're saved by Christ and circumcision. Remember that? Acts 15 and Galatians, Philippians, Colossians, Romans. Holy cow, it's everything Paul talked about in his letters. The Judaizers. So when Assyria comes into our land, and when he shall walk in our palaces, then we shall raise up against him seven shepherds and eight anointed ones from among men. And they shall mar the land of Assyria with the sword. The sword of what? It's the sword of the gospel. 
The word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Uh, there's a mouth, there's a sword that proceeds out of the mouth of the lamb. It's the word of God, and we're going to get to a cool sword passage. You're going to love it. Hang with me. I'm almost done. There's a super cool sword passage that will just bless your socks off. And the land of Nimrod at her own entrances, and he shall deliver us from Assyria when he comes into our land. And when he treads within our border, and the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many peoples as dew from Jehovah. I highlighted dew, and I highlighted showers. Keep in mind, when you read Old Testament prophetic context, when you read about uh, showers and rivers and dew and, and pools of water, that's Jesus, man. Jesus said he's the living waters. As showers on a blade of grass, which does not wait for man, nor delay for the sons of men. And then he says here, and you'll like this. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the nations, in the midst of many peoples like a lion. Now our first lion is Jesus. And Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And then he call, says to the disciples, you are the light of the world. And then he says to the remnant of Jacob, he says, well, he calls himself the lion from the tribe of Judah. We see that in Revelation, clearly. And then he calls his own people a lion. You say, what do you mean a lion? What, what, what's the purpose of calling his people a lion? Because lions are the king of beasts, man. They go in and take names, but they don't take names like the legalists think we take names. We take names through love and the gospel. Whoa, that's foreign. Wait, what? Come on, I want to talk, you know, like Mark Driscoll said, man. I don't see Jesus as this meek and lowly guy. I see him coming down with, you know, on a white horse with a, a javelin and a tattoo on his leg. And, you know, that's how they like, they, they love that idea. They love to envision the kingdom dominion as having swords like Joshua and Caleb. But Paul said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. You see, that's fleshly. That's Old Testament style. And they do it with words too. And I think too many professing Christians today judge using harsh words. You have... I am exacting wrath upon you by your love they will know you're my disciples so how does the world look at us you see the gospel is this Christ crucified savior of sinners risen triumphant over death. He has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. We cannot save ourselves. We are hopeless, desperately depraved and destitute. We have nothing, no power in my flesh dwells no, no good thing. The Bible says, for when we were yet without strength, Christ died for us. That's what we proclaim. We proclaim that about ourselves and what has happened with us. And we proclaim that through faith in Christ, abandoning self-righteousness, completely resigning to ability, will, effort, and power. We have resigned ourselves to those things. We, we have forsaken, we have cast them behind us as a menstruous cloth, as Isaiah says. And people have a response. They either trust in Christ or they don't. And if they don't, it is the savor of death unto God. And if they do, it is the savor of life unto God. We need not say another thing. That is the gospel. That is the sword. What I just proclaimed to you is the sword. We don't need to say, you're going to hell. You're damned. We don't need to say that. We've got a gospel that's more powerful than bitter words, than harsh words. We've got a gospel that proclaims grace and the cross of Jesus. 
and the, the sovereign power of God over the will of man to change the heart and bring mankind to himself through his Holy Spirit. That's the gospel. That's the sword of the Spirit. And so he says, you'll be like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who if he goes through both tramples and tears in pieces, and there's none to snatch back. Your hand shall be high above your foes, and all your enemies shall be cut off. How are they cut off? We preach the gospel. That's it. They wanted dominion over Pilate and over Rome. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. My cross and resurrection. They bring dominion in one way or the other. You get it? The Bible says, thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph. 2 Corinthians 2, 1 Corinthians 15. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory. We're not waiting for any victory, folks. We're not waiting for it. I'm not waiting for victory. I got it now because it's in Christ. I have no victory in myself. You have no victory in yourself. Where's the joy found? It's in Christ. We're triumphing. When, it's, when we feel like we're defeated, when we feel like we've been run over by a secularist or by a legalist or someone who believes in false religion, we feel like we've been trampled, we feel like the, the debate, we lost the debate. Who cares? Just give the gospel. When all else fails, just talk about the gospel and the cross of Christ. If you lose an argument, don't worry about it. You know what? We've got a wonderful resort. It shouldn't be our last resort. It should be what, it, what consumes us. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, both to the Jew first and then to the Greek. What is the gospel? It's Christ. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. The Bible says Christ is the power of God. The gospel and Christ are synonymous. When we preach the gospel, we're preaching Christ. He's the sword. Let him do the work by preaching the finished work. And now finally, go over to the left. If you look over to the left, right over here, Isaiah 54, I love this. Here's the sovereignty of God in action and the kingdom of God and the victory of God's triumphant people. This is their heritage. We'll finish up here. Behold, I have created the smith. This is God who's sovereign. I have created the smith who blows the coals in the fire, who brings out a tool for his work. And I have created the waster to destroy. So he makes these weapons, right? God causes these people to make weapons. And he says, no weapon that is formed against you. We sing the song, the battle belongs to the Lord. Remember that? No weapon that is formed against you shall be blessed. Well, what is the weapon? What is the weapon? Do we think, well, it's a sword, you know? It's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's the, the liberals. You know, it's the liberal party. Oh, gosh, you know? Or it's the Republicans. It's Trump. He's the sword. No, watch what the sword is. No weapon that is formed against you shall be blessed, and every what? Tongue that shall rise against you in judgment. In other words, they try to judge you because you believe in grace. You shall condemn. Well, Christians make this a, interpret this with, in horrible fashion. Yes, I will. I condemn you. You know, they turn it into harsh. No, no, that's, we're not to do that. That's not what he's talking about. We preach the gospel. This is the inheritance of the Lord Jehovah, and their righteousness is from me. That's imputed righteousness of Romans 3, baby. That's it. When we have the righteousness of God, we preach it. We preach that we have righteousness because of him, not because of our works. And that is how we condemn those who rise up in judgment against us with their tongues. <laughs> This is critical. This is super critical. And this is how the, all of this kingdom language applies to us. It's the everlasting gospel. It's triumphant. And it will never be thwarted. Jesus says, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of death and hell and the grave will never prevail against it. The church triumphant throughout all ages. Glory to Christ, to God in the church, the Bible says. Throughout all ages, Ephesians 3.21. And so finally, it shall be in that day. Key phrase, remember that? I forgot to highlight it. It shall be in that day. What day? The day of the governor who came out of Bethlehem. Same time frame. 
How about that? Time statements in the Old Testament. <laughs> Gotta love that. And so in that day, says the Lord, I will cut off your horses out of your midst. Israel was always trusting in chariots and horses and other nations. I'm going to cut them off and I will destroy your chariots and I will cut off the cities out of your land and throw down all your strongholds. Ah, how do we throw down strongholds? Second Corinthians 10. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down every imagination and loftiness that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Right? How do we pull down the stronghold? It's the gospel. That's how we do it. It's not by physical horses or chariots or tanks or a Cobra helicopters. Who was it? Hal Lindsey. He says, I will cut off sorceries out of your land and there shall not be fortune tellers among you. I will cut off your graven images and your pillars out of the midst of you and you shall never again worship the work of your hands. Self-righteousness. That's what happens when God saves us by his grace. We never again trust our self-righteousness. And so that's it. I'll finish up with this last one. Pluck you out of the shrines of the midst of you. I'll destroy your cities. I'll execute vengeance. You see that? I'll execute vengeance. Now down to Psalm 149, let the saints be joyful in glory. That's where we are right now. We're in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Come to me, I'll give you rest. We're in our beds. We're resting in Christ. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. There's the gospel. What does it do? To carry out vengeance on the nations and punishments of the people. To bind their kings with chains and their nobles with iron bands. To carry out on them the judgment written. This is an honor. For all his saints. Remember Isaiah chapter 54? Every tongue that rises up you against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the Lord. It says the same thing here. To carry out on them the judgment written. This is an honor for all his saints. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right. So I know that was kind of a long study. Get back in here. And I am going to allow uh, talking. <laughs> I know that sounds terrible. Let me talk. Well, guys and gals, um, I would love to hear your thoughts on those verses, some things that came to your mind, any other verses, feel free to speak up. I sure have enjoyed being able to talk to you about these things. Ward? Yes. Hi, this is May May. Oh, hey, Addie. Hi. Hi. I really enjoyed the study, but what I have um, to share is that it's a real good reminder of uh, the kingdom. Uh, where we sit in the kingdom with Jesus. And it's amazing how if we just focus on that, like you said, meditate more on that, it does bring much joy. So that if someone did try to condemn us, it would it'd be nothing. It's just like whatever. We just proclaim love and grace. And it's very beautiful when you can recognize that in the soul and in the heart. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense, and it's very difficult for, for us, even as Christians, to really contemplate the gospel and love as a weapon. Yeah. You know, uh, if, if we would spend more time doing that, we would spend less time using devouring words and hurtful, mean-spirited words to condemn people, and instead just proclaim the gospel and let the lion from the tribe of Judah do his work, man. Yeah. Yeah. Let him sort it all out. We just preach grace in the kingdom of God. Amen. I mean, that's a triumphant gospel, you know. Uh, I've had a lot of interaction with post-millennial reconstructionists who are all about this kind of physical dominion. And, and they don't give the gospel the power that, and, and, the, and the rightful place that it deserves. If they understood, if they truly understood, you know, a lot of them make claims about the gospel, but if they truly understood the gospel, they would understand, man, the gospel is far more power, more powerful than their dominion theology that they're, that they're espousing. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thanks, Addy. I, I absolutely, I appreciate it. Anybody else? Any thoughts? Well, I have to say that, I mean, I am totally joyful that you and Martha could come out and just, you know, just be joyful. I, I've always wondered why I don't see that much joy when people proclaim that they belong in the kingdom of God, that they're in the kingdom of God and they're in Jesus. I don't understand that because we 
are the most, we should be the most joyful people. Absolutely. Yeah, no doubt. You know, but I, like I say, it's a, we, we, we go through these phases where we don't meditate on it and we don't engage ourselves in, in, in these contexts like this, you know, when you do, it's just like, wow. Yeah, and you're right. You know, we do need to understand the Old Testament to know where we are right now, and then maybe that's where to come in. For sure, and it does. It helps us understand why those guys were so happy. Yeah, yeah. In the first century. Hey, Ward, I uh, really like what you said about meditation. It says in the Proverbs that uh, the house is built by wisdom and by Established by understanding. And I think an understanding that is where meditation really comes, mm -hmm. takes its place. The more we meditate on something, the more the light will, the bigger the light will get if you allow me to say that. So uh, you can't, you can't, uh, I always, when I go to bed at night, that's what I, that one of my prayers that God will give me understanding. And amazingly enough, it comes through dreams and visions. <laughs> so, I had the thoughts, but they, they left me like, you know, when you start speaking, you forget what you were going to say, and I've come to that point. So, <laughs> Well, when it comes around, speak up. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll pass right now, okay? All right. Any other words? Any any verses that came to mind? I know this, uh, you know, as I go through these passages, believe me, I had like a ton that I wanted to make reference to, but we will get to them because there are so many other passages that deal with these different types of kingdom elements. And uh, eventually, Lord willing, we'll hit on all of them. But um, any verses that stand out in your mind that you make connections. I mean, that's what's cool. When you really begin to know these contexts, you start making these connections. And it's like this dot to dot, Old Testament kingdom prophecy, Jesus Christ. It, it creates this beautiful picture of the kingdom and Christ and his, and, and his dominion and, and triumph over death. It's just all related. It's all related, but you got to put them together. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm doing a meditating on uh, the, uh, the Trinity of God and... Uh, it's just amazing, although all three characters, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they're all one, but on the same hand, they're all separate as well. Uh, God is the creator of all things visible and invisible, like it says in Colossians. But the Son is a, me is, a, is a messenger of covenant, and he's also the mediator and the redeemer of Israel that God had chosen and taken out of the world and to be called his people. And the spirit is kind of related to the, new, to the second co uh, covenant because that's what draws us unto his son and gives us comfort and guides and, and instructs us in the way of righteousness. They have three different all three players have different functions, yet they are all three God. So the threefold cord is not easily broken, is it? It just goes on. You never break it. So yeah. It's mighty powerful. Yeah, it sure is. Yeah. Absolutely. That's it. Right. How about you, Dan? Other Robert? Mike? Adam? I'm dead tired. I don't have much to say right now. But <laughs> it was a great message on meditation, though. I need to definitely do more. Awesome. How about you, Lynette? How are you? Good. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Thanks for the message. Oh, you're welcome. Absolutely. Mike, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I thought that was a pretty good word. Like every time I hear things on Isaiah, I realize how deep. I mean, every chapter, I mean, he's like talking about you know Jesus or the new kingdom, and almost every, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, it makes me think of more about Isaiah 54, which I don't know much about. I mean, I know 65, 66 talks about the new heaven, new earth, and there's like a slew of 
like everything in Isaiah, like it makes you feel like going back and reading, you know, the whole book again or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's pretty, pretty deep stuff, you know. <laughs> it sure is. Absolutely. Well, I'm with you on that one, man. Isaiah is just like mm -hmm. pregnant with kingdom language and yeah. reference. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Here, uh, when you, in, in Isaiah, when you uh, verse up. And when I, when I think of that in relation to in Daniel, I don't think the connection is made. But in Daniel, he had, in terms of the different empires, if you notice, each empire became symbolized by a, a less, a more inferior product. And so I see that almost as a managed government to decrease as gods to decrease. Yeah. Kind of like John the Baptist? Well, I like to th uh, think that, yeah, I, I suppose, yeah. Uh, but this idea, and I hear it very many times, about the th three great institutions of God's creation, the family, church, and government. I could point to the time or the origin of the family and in the church. But government, when I point to that, I don't see it in such uh, uh, sanctified terms. In other words, First Samuel uh, is, is hardly uh, a, 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 he, he gave the, a government to them, a central government that is in his anger. And it just, it just hit me when you read in uh, Isaiah, of his government, that there shall be no end. And I, I just mm -hmm. think another way to proclaim his, uh, his sovereignty and his uh, majestic power, I'd say. Amen. Yes. Huge. And you know what? I, you know, I, I sometimes express my viewpoint on Facebook. <laughs> and, uh, you know, every once in a while, I'll make some political reference. And what's really comforting to me, and I was talking about, I was talking to the, uh, John Hedges about this yesterday. And he, who's, his, his nickname, I think, is Jed Eckert. But I was talking to him the other day, and one of the things I, I just said to him, and I've always felt this way, and that is, if all the people who spent so much of their time arguing for a particular political candidate, spent their time following the first Timothy prescription of praying for kings and those who are in authority so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, I think we would have, there would be a lot more efficacious work going on in regard to government, you know, because you really don't see Paul encouraging revolution or Jesus for that matter, but you see them caring mm -hmm. for those in authority. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, and, and, and when I say caring, I mean that they want us to live quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness and honesty. And so they are, yes, Jesus is concerned about government. I mean, after all, he's the one who puts governments there. You know, he's the one who ordains them. He brings up kings, he puts down another one. You know, First Samuel 2, the Psalms is very clear on that. And, and I just think that I rest so much more when I go back to the power of God, praying, if I, if a couple things, acknowledge that God ordains them, but also acknowledge that God uses prayer as a means sort of vehicle to accomplish quiet, peaceable life and all godliness and honesty for his people. And does that mean that every group of Christians and around the world is experiencing quietness and honesty. I, I just think that we should be praying more at least as much as we're arguing for our candidate Amen. preference or political party or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I hear you. And it's Christ's government. We are the ones who are victorious. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not about a physical, we're the ones who are victorious over all governments 
through Christ. Yeah. I mean, really, Christ, you know, the kingdoms of this world have become, that's what Revelation said, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord mm-hmm. and of his Christ. That's mm-hmm. Handel's Messiah, too. And he shall reign forever and ever, you know. It's, you know I think I'm tracking with you, Robert. I don't know. <laughs> when, when Timothy, first Timothy, uh, Paul says it to the only king and the only potentate. And I guess what what I would say uh, in the, the, the joy you talked about is very, uh, very, uh, what you, uh, is very proper what you're talking about is a very proper subject. I guess for me, what com- not robs or, but compete certainly with this joy we should have, or I should have, is there a lot of things to be angry about uh, in terms of this uh, governmental growth that has arrogantly encroached on the other two institutions of the of of of, the, of God's creation that is the family and the church to the point where they actually play second fiddle to this human government and again I point out this human government origin is one in which God said I gave you a government or a, a king which we might as well say today I gave you federal government or a president in my anger and to me it was akin to an idol and if preterism, to me, really has the answer, but it, it, it's, it's not enough preterists out there to, for it to take maybe the proper route. And again, I guess, as, as I said, each government, I think it's very interesting that each image of a, of a controlling government in, the, in Daniel's vision, each one was represented by a more inferior product, gold, silver, dimension, iron, and clay. Mm, yeah, yeah, God, I hear you. Christ's government is one to to, uh, to grow and never have an end. Right. So. Absolutely. Yeah, I think uh, pulling Daniel into this whole uh, subject is, is super important in how God deals with these pagan empires. Mm. And how he says, in the days of these kings, you know, the Roman Empire, he says... The God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's, it's I, I mean, what is that Roman empire? Is, it, is that the one that's described as be, have, having been mixed with iron and clay? Yes. Yes. Okay. So in the days of those Kings, I think like Daniel two forty four uh, is so powerful um, just to, speak of this kingdom that is not of this world, but that yet is victorious over this world, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's victorious by the gospel, not by the industrial military industrial complex. (laughs) That's right. Uh, Or as you said, not at the point of a sword, but through arguing, hopefully superior arguing and arguing, meaning discussion and reasoning. Yeah. And that's why, and that's interesting too. That is why I can never understand why those who try to convert against a sword. There's a saying, he who is converted against his will is of the same opinion still. And if you wanted to demonstrate it, give him the sword, put it in his hand. He'll, he'll demonstrate that he's of the same persuasion. I can't understand these, these persuasions at the sword. They're not real persuasion. They're not uh, persuasions that go to the heart. It's got to come. It, it's got to be voluntary. Otherwise, that's that's part of what belief is. It's got to be a voluntary persuasion that a thing is true. Yeah, absolutely. And it's all, that you know, the more and more I look at how God has brought about a sort of a, 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 a more serious presence of the, the fulfilled kingdom of God during the time of the Internet, And also during the time of this political circus that's going on, I think what God is doing, I I personally think this is he's dismaying right-wing fundamental evangelicalism for its trust in the works of the flesh, much like Mm -hmm. the Pharisees of old. And I think, I think what he's doing is he's, is he's bringing that, that edifice down so that we go back to trust in the sovereign potentate, like you said, I love that passage from Timothy. That's a fantastic passage, you know. And and, and Timothy also says this. I love this. It says, now 
unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. Well, because you know, she made my screen. Glory now. forever. You know, it's just, I, I'm looking I forward. I know a lot of Christians, and even I get this way sometimes, you know, when, when I'm just sitting there getting caught up in all the, just the, just the junk that's out there. I mean, I just read stuff every day that's like, oh, it's oppressive, you know? And, and then I sit there and I realize, oh my gosh, Jesus is on the throne and mm -hmm. he's controlling these guys that, you know, Proverbs 21, one, the King's heart is in the hand of the mm -hmm. Lord and like yeah. the rivers of water, he directs it whithersoever he wills. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, yeah. hallelujah. God, you're running this show. Yes. <laughs> Whether it's Trump or Clinton or me. <laughs> so, just kidding. I'm not running. I'm just yeah. saying, man, God's running this show and that gives me great, great comfort. Yeah, yeah. I sometimes get angry. But man, once you go back to God's sovereignty and he brings the counsel of the heathen to nothing, Psalm 33, 10 and 11, oh my gosh. It's just, I get joyful again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like swimming with God. Swim, swim, swim. Just being with him. It's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Hey, man, Addy. Good metaphor. <laughs> well, any, any last thoughts before I hit stop on the record? Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's good study. Thanks. Yes. And Dan, it was good to have you tonight, too. So it's also, we, we are so thankful also to meet other brethren that we, even though, you know, we don't see each other physically, well, we see